We want to pray for them and uh, believe God that God's going to have his way. So, Father, we just thank you for our time together. We thank you for our friendship in the kingdom, our commitment together. Thank you, God, that you've called us to such a time as this. And Father, we pray that you administer to Walt Healy. We thank you, God, that nothing is impossible for him who believes. We thank you that we look not on the things that are seen, but we look at the things that are unseen. And you said that with faith, we can move mountains. You said it, nothing is impossible to him who believes. And so, Father, we pray that even as healing the sick is playing in their house, the faith level for Maureen and Walt will rise, that the faith level of every person in his family will rise in such a way that there will be an amazing move of the spirit, that there'll be no hindrance through looking at the natural that there'll be no hindrance, that they would look at your supernatural power and your ability, that faith would supernaturally rise inside of them, that you would bring total healing. And we bind every work of hell against their mind, all fear and un unbelief and doubt. Father, we release the power of God upon them. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. As a group, we agree and we pray and understand that with you, nothing is impossible. We give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. All right. Well, good to see everybody. Um, welcome, everybody who just joined. We're going to continue to talk about um, the subject that we started a few weeks ago because, you know, during the season of Lent, it's important we, we try to shift gears away from some of the craziness of the world and uh, shift it towards growing in Christ. I want to just get my notes situated here. All right. Um, so we're going to talk about seven characteristics needed for true transformation. And some of this is very simple. It's always good to be reminded of things we heard a long time ago. But, uh, you know, as we know, what good is it if we win the world and lose our soul? And many of us have lost our soul in the midst of compassion fatigue, betrayal, constant crises, uh, dealing with unhealthy culture in the world and in the church. And if we're not careful, our emotions and our mind will be uh, lost, basically. Not that we'll lose our salvation, but uh, the pain can deaden us and uh, the constant responsibilities can kill us and so because of that we have to have habit patterns in our life that enable us to come out of the blizzard so to speak as Pete Scazzaro said in one of his books um, and be able to be refreshed and restored and we see that in Psalm 23 where David says that he restores my soul after he leads me to the still waters. And so the still waters is a place of reflection. Uh, when the waters are still, you could see yourself, you could see your face. And it takes uh, quiet and contemplation and reflection in order to be self-aware. And constant busyness will eventually wound us to the point in which We'll lose a lot of ground emotionally and spiritually. So uh, I've asked Greg to help me with this discussion today, and then we'll open it up. But uh, so without further ado, seven characteristics needed for true spiritual formation. And when we talk about spiritual formation, we're talking about being 
made in the image of Christ himself. And Romans 8, 29, it says that that, that is the highest calling that we have is to be Christ-like. So let's just start with a first of seven attributes or habit patterns that we need to practice. And again, these are very simple uh, truths or principles. They are not profound. They are profound in their impact, but not profound in quote unquote deep revelation. If it's complicated, then it's not of God. If it's simple, it's, it's in line with the rhythms of, of creation and nature that God designed. Uh, so number one, it's simple. Give God opportunity to work in your life. This has to be done with the rhythms of our life. Again, we're so busy, we need to establish habit patterns that we do not cross or violate or else we'll be led astray with our activities. And so we have to ask ourselves the questions, do we prioritize regular scripture reading, prayer and contemplation? Do we attempt to walk in the presence of God throughout the day? Do we take time alone for silence and solitude and contemplation? Are we allowing ourselves to be in group settings that enable us to grow in hearing what God is saying and doing? Of course, we are every week, all of us are. Um, and so these are rhythms. Ruth Haley Barton wrote a book called Sacred Rhythms that I think would be great for everyone to buy, especially related to this particular point. But if we don't have boundaries, if we don't have habit patterns that are set in stone that we only violate as an exception, not as a general rule. Uh, we don't do that. We're eventually go going to be operating without the grace of God. And we're not going to give God the space or the opportunity to work in our life. Along with that point, I'll just jump to point two, and then I'll ask uh, Greg to weigh in. The reason why we need to allow God opportunity to work in our life is because only God can transform us. We cannot transform ourselves. The only thing we could do is have the right rhythms and habit patterns that give God um, the Bishop Joe did say that he was in a place where he was having a difficult time with the streaming. So it is entirely possible that he might be locked out and have to get back in again. Um, but um, I'm in the background watching out for that. Um, so um, the second point, I, I didn't think he finished it. Maybe he can continue once he gets back in uh, or once his streaming normalizes. Uh, but. Uh, if Greg could go right into the second or the third point, uh, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, I have Bishop's notes so I can continue until he can jump back in. Happy to do that. Uh, so he was about maybe, the maybe first like point to... was. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. The first point was give God opportunity to work in your life, uh, taking time to prioritize regular scripture reading, prayer, and contemplation and really not to compromise those things. It's just so important to have those habits. Uh, and then the second point was we need to understand that only God uh, transform us. And I, it looks like Bishop Joe is back. So I'll just toss it right back to him then. Apologize. I think he needs to be unmuted. Yeah, okay. Well. Yeah, I'm sure you could have uh, shared on that point, but all I was going to say is because God has to be the one to transform us so we can't transform ourselves. It takes psychological pressure off of us and shows us the need to prioritize time alone with God. And as John the Baptist said, he must increase and then we will decrease. So, uh, Greg, why don't you share? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get on another Wi-Fi because okay. uh, I can't afford for this to keep happening. So I'm gonna use a hotspot with my phone. But so Greg, why don't you share in these two points and uh, I might okay. wind up being disconnected. Okay, uh, 
on the first point, uh, I, I really took to heart last week uh, of the time that we had here on CCC Zoom with uh, Dr. Paul Van Valen, and he recommended a book, and I went out and got it, and boy, I want to recommend it now. It is absolutely dynamite. Uh, it's called The Gift of Being Yourself. Uh, it's, it's a real quick read, although if you're like me, it's not, it's not going to uh, be real quick through it. Um, the subtitle is The Sacred Call of Self-Discovery. And the whole point there is the main way that we know God is through who we are. Uh, and the closer that we get to Christ likeness, we actually become more unique. That's one of the things that's always troubled me about Christianity is how so many times our spirituality can tend to be this superficial, everybody looks alike, talks alike, dresses alike. Uh, and the author uh, of this book, David Benner, uh, actually, you know, has a very different perspective on that. And I'm just finding going slow through it, how meaningful that this really is. So I uh, want to recommend that, uh, that, that book. And, and these staples are really um, what sets the tone for the day, the daily devotion, the prayer. And it's not about checking the box. I think the main thing is that we need to always be focused on scripture reading. I read this much or I prayed or, you know, devotional. But did we connect with in a meaningful way? Sometimes that's going to be, you know, 20 minutes. Sometimes it's going to take longer than that. Uh, but that's, that's what I really look for um, in a morning devotionals, in a morning type of uh, ritual, spiritual habits is connecting with God in a real meaningful way each day. And then the second point, we need to understand that only God can, can transform us. I remember, uh, I still guess I'm young, but when I was a real young pastor, uh, I just got the idea in my mind. I think it was God uh, put it in there uh, to just learn more, read more about humility. And there's not much written from a Christian perspective about humility at all. It's kind of like the forgotten virtue. Uh, there's a few, few books more recently that have been written in the last 10 years or so, but I'm talking about 25, 30 years ago. Uh, not an awful lot available. And, uh, and yet there's so much that Jesus talks about humility and the real humility, uh, the scripture tells us uh, the importance of humility is that God is the one that transforms us. And as Bishop said, uh, that takes the pressure off of us, psychological pressure off of you and me. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my wife and I were in Hawaii celebrating our 30th anniversary and uh, we went to a store. I bought a hat. I'm a, as you can tell, you know, they say when the uh, when the roof loses its shingles, it's time to get a tarp. And so I wear a lot of hats to protect this. And uh, we went to this store called He is Greater Than I. And uh, just, uh, I love this Christian brand and I bought this hat because it's just a reminder that he is greater than I. He must increase and I must decrease. And so just making that a regular part of our daily prayer is, if God, I humble myself before you today what this day holds but you know it you already see it vividly and i trust you i'm going to be obedient to your holy spirit work in me work through me uh and and i just humble myself before you every day and making that i think also a key point to this uh uh our daily disciplines and inviting god's work into our life and i just think that's what's a question every spiritual leader should be able to answer at any point what is God doing in your life right now? Not even so much, what is he saying? What's he doing in your life right now at this moment? I, I think that's, uh, that, that is critical just for our spiritual progress and uh, transformation in our lives. Yes, that's great. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right, I've switched to my hotspot. Let's hope it doesn't grow cold and become a cold spot. All right. So uh, we're going to go to the third part of transformation. And um, this is we must understand that marriage and family is meant to make us holy, not happy. And that is from a book called Sacred Marriage. It's probably the best book I ever read on marriage. And I will take credit for telling Paul about that book. Uh, by David Banner too, that I have to let my ego kick in there. But 
I remember reading that book 20 years ago. Um, and David has a few other books. Um, every book that David Banner has is really, really good. Um, and there's um, all the books by Ruth Haley Barton. I would recommend that Ruth Haley, H-A-L-E-Y, Barton, B-A-R-T-O-N. And uh, Pete Scazzara has a book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, and another one, The Emotionally Healthy Church. So those are really strong staples in, in this conversation. But the best book probably um, I've ever read from both the theological perspective and uh, an emotional and spiritual perspective is your spiritual journey, your spiritual journey. And um, uh, I forgot the guy who wrote that. And then his second book that builds on that, they're profound books. And I would have to figure out what the, who the author is, but we have recommended it before. So perhaps somebody here can remind me who wrote those books. Um, but yeah, those, those books are amazing. Okay, so uh, why am I talking about marriage and family? Well, if you're single, nothing wrong with that, but I will propose that uh, nothing brings out spiritual and emotional maturity more or the need for it more than marriage and family. Because when you get married, you have to die in order to live because the two become one flesh. So when we're in the process of becoming one flesh, somebody or something has to give at all times. And uh, that is a very profound thing that I discovered because I, I got married after I was saved about two and a half years and I thought I was really a man of God until I got married. And I realized I still had a bad temper and then after three years, we had our first child and having children and being married causes you to die to self, can't control when you go out, when, how much sleep you have, when you could eat. You have to be fully available to the needs of other human beings. So to me, God uses marriage and family for spiritual formation. It's one of the primary vehicles that crucifies the flesh and gets even more intense, as I said, after you have children. And so the reason why so many uh, marriages fall apart in the West, in our civilization, is because we've gone into marriage with the, the wrong assumption uh, that we equate love and feelings or romance together. And people think they're supposed to get married because they fell in love with somebody and uh, they don't take into consideration other things like commonality, common purpose, views regarding faith, politics, the amount of children they desire to have. And so when we base our marriage solely on our feelings, we will be greatly disillusioned and eventually want to divorce and look for the feeling of love all over again with somebody else. So it's almost like a drug. It's like a, um, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, when you feel uh, that adrenaline, you feel that rush, that feeling of, of love and butterflies and all of that. And uh, when people don't have that feeling, they think they have the excuse to go to, to go to be with somebody else. Um, and that's why there's so many divorces even in the church. So we have to go back to the biblical definition of agape love, of unconditional love, of sacrificial love, of the first Corinthians 13 love that has a lot to do with the fruit of the spirit and our will and humility. Um, and it's interesting how arranged marriages that we see in uh, India and other places, arranged marriages generally have few divorces. It's very rare as opposed to the West the Western marriages start off hot and end up cold. The arranged marriages start off cold, but wind up becoming hot because they understand it's based on commitment. So those in the West 
uh, have more instances of divorce because of a superficial narcissistic need-based feelings of romance that is their basic assumption for marriage. Of course, romance is given us by God, so I'm not minimizing the feeling of love. It's a gift of God, and that could and always be present, but it cannot be present solely based on our feelings. It has to be first undergirded by covenant and an intent to love our spouse and to love our children. So I believe that that is a great shaper of our character. Uh, not to say that if someone is not led to get married that they cannot become like Christ. Of course, there'll be other challenges that God will give you that will crucify your flesh. But because most people do get married and many of them have children, we also have to look at that as a way of shaping us into Christ-likeness. Uh, Greg, why don't you share on that? I, I, I think uh, oftentimes in the church, in ministry settings, we, we overlook the importance really of, of, of this point in, in in terms of even qualification spiritual leadership, um, that it's it's how a, a person treats their spouse, how they relate to them in a healthy way, how they if they're married, how, how they relate to their children. Um, I mean, it just it just doesn't get any more practical. Uh, and obviously, God <laughs> understood the the importance of uh, family and and marriage, and how much. Uh, how we lead and conduct ourselves in those relationships, marriage and family, is really going to show how we conduct ourselves in the house of God in, in leadership, according to 1 Timothy 3, 2, and, and verse 4 through 5 as well. So, you know, sometimes I, I think when we're considering, uh, I know we're talking about this at a personal level, at a leadership level, when we're considering peace, people for leadership, um, that, that we, we need to take even more seriously, you know, get under the hood how what's going on in the mix what's going on in the house um even more so maybe sometimes than doctrine as important as that is um it seems like this the relationship with the spouse and the relationship with the kids is even uh uh just as important i think it could be clearly said so uh i think that that comes to to prioritizing those relationships um and uh you know i I'm thankful that my father set me a really great example uh, in putting my mother ahead of us as children and putting our family ahead of the local church as well. I think that's a big reason why I'm in ministry today is because of that example that my father set. And uh, I remember him standing up on, regularly on Sundays and saying, hey, I love all of you, but I don't love any of you as much as I love my children. And I don't love my children as much as my wife. And uh, that didn't make me insecure. That made me work that out uh, that we were the priority in his life. And nothing challenges us uh, like that to become in one. And uh, my wife and I've been married 30 years. We haven't arrived at some level of perfection. We're 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 getting better all the time. Um, but uh, th th there's no question in my life that. Uh, next to direct Holy Spirit power in my life that my wife has been the greatest agent of change for good and godliness in my life. And uh, I think that's the way God always wants it to be. If you are married, um, that dying to ourselves as, as I should be as a husband, laying my life down as Christ did for the church, uh, laying my life down for my, for my wife um, and, and then for my kids as well. So not much more I can say on that because I am a work in progress uh, for sure. But uh, after 30 years, she's told me she'd still say yes. So I guess that's pretty good. Uh, you know, so far, so good. Yeah, excellent. Well, again, this is uh, not pro, this is profound, but it's not deep in terms of revelation, but it's something we have to remind ourselves as leaders. Um, and once we understand the redemptive view of, of marriage and family and how it's connected to the kingdom, it actually helps us 
uh, to equate Christ-likeness with said marriage and family and not look at it as just an extra burden or an annoyance or something holding back our calling or something separate from the kingdom. Uh, and that's important. My book, A Walk in Generational Blessings, also deals with connecting kingdom and marriage together. Um, okay, here's another point. And if I get cut off, Greg has all my notes. Here's another thing that shapes us into Christ-likeness or the potential to do that. And that is how we respond in a crisis illustrates how much spiritual formation we have. So God allows crises, outside stimuli, outside challenges um, to, to shape us and mold us. And it's a very common knowledge. It's not in a time of peace, but during a time of war, that shows if we're, if we're really trusting and resting in God. And so on the road to spiritual formation, we need to detect honestly how we are responding to our stimuli, how we are responding to our stimuli. Uh, Greg, you want to share on that? Sure. I, I, I think that you know, obviously the year 2020 was an exceptionally unusual year for all of us. And uh, myself included, I was a little surprised at some things that came out of me in the middle of just, uh, you know, stress and, and strain like that. And uh, I think it's a good report card for us uh, not to get down on on ourselves, but realizing, you know, we have not arrived. And, uh, uh, you, you know, pressure, uh, I, I coached high school football coach. Uh, I was uh, coached high school football for 12 years in the public school system. And one thing we used to always tell the kids is pressure is a privilege. Pressure is a privilege. You gotta get used to pressure and functioning under pressure and allowing pressure to show us what's really inside of us. I heard a quote recently, I don't know who, who said it, but it really struck me, uh, sit with the warriors, the conversation is different. And, and uh, it, you know, when, when you sit with people that have fought battles and won, that, that are uh, thriving, uh, not just surviving, but thriving in times of difficulty and pressure, there's a different mindset, there's a different mentality, there's a different perspective of how they see the world. And, and that's what we really need, easy to lead in, in times of peace and tranquility, uh, you know, when there's, when there's money in the bank and uh, no one can find a seat on Sunday morning. That's really kind of easy to lead, uh, but but that's probably not that's not what happened to me in 2020. It's probably not what happened to you as well, and so it really does show who are we really trusting in uh, our own ingenuity, our own creativity, our own gifts and abilities, or, or really trusting in God uh, and and leaning into Him and pressing into Him. And when these things pop up or pop out under pressure, what do we do with them then? Because I think God just allows the heat to be turned up uh, to really show us what's inside, that there's more work to be done. Yes. My pastor always used to tell me, it's never the things that happen to you that destroy you. It's how you respond that will determine whether you grow or whether you're destroyed. Okay, number five, how we respond when we are criticized, second-guessed, or when people disagree with us is a window into our soul that shows us how we truly are doing in our quest to be like Jesus. Especially those who are under your authority, if they question you or they disagree with you. It could happen with peers, it could happen with people overseeing you as well, of course. But generally speaking, uh, I have found that uh, you know, the people that tend to get very defensive when you talk to them uh, or disagree or bring out ideas or second guess them, I equate that with emotional immaturity, and it definitely puts a cap on spiritual maturity. We can't separate emotional and spiritual maturity. So this is another way we could gauge our spirituality or our Christ formation. Now, it doesn't mean if you have an argument or 
you know, you get a little defensive that, oh my God, you aren't spiritually mature. We're not going to go that extreme, but we're talking about as a consistent habit pattern. Uh, are we defensive every time someone questions us? Do we hold unforgiveness? Are we filled with anger towards others? So these are questions that we have to ask ourselves. So Greg, anything on that? Yeah, I think this is a this is a real tough one. I mean, they all are, uh, but but criticism especially. And um, one of the things that I have uh, tried to cultivate in our church here, our our ministry here, is actually cultivating feedback, asking for it uh, regularly. And and again, that's kind of like the coach in me is, um, you know, always reviewing what we've done, reviewing the sermon. What could I have done better? What didn't make sense? What was a rabbit trail? Uh, I, I do that after every single service that I preach on Sundays. Uh, and it's very, very helpful. And then when there is, you, you can tell then when there's constructive criticism that is meant to help, most of the time that's born out of relationship. Um, and, and then there's just uh, someone who's got a chip on their shoulder. That's, that's kind of obvious, it becomes real clear. But I found that if we just solicit more feedback, that doesn't mean to be people pleasers. Uh, it's just we all can improve. We, we, we all can get better. Uh, and it kind of creates a culture where uh, it, it's more of a critique than necessarily uh, destructive criticism. That's been real helpful for me uh, through the years. And, and again, I, I didn't learn that in church. I learned that in the locker room uh, coaching high school football, always evaluating myself and, and what I'm doing and asking for evaluation from, from others that are going to be honest. You know, they have their, your best interest at heart. And, and if all you ever hear is that's great, that's great. You need to get other folks around you uh, that, that really are going to be honest with you and, and can be uh, speak the truth in love at the same time. Yeah. And of course that's, characteristic that we need to have uh, in every area of our life not just our preaching but having a feedback system system for our preaching can be very intimidating and very um, cringeworthy um, but it would be very helpful there are things that we regularly do whether it's body language or uh, not having the right cadence or not being practical enough for things like that, that we wouldn't even realize if others didn't tell us. But that's only one aspect of, of getting feedback. Um, number six, and I'm assuming everybody here understands this already, like the other points, but number six is, are we functioning with and through the local church? And of course, according to Ephesians 4, in the context of fivefold ministry, it speaks about how we're to be equipping the saints until we come to the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ unto a perfect man. And then in verse 16, it talks about how this will take place when each member does its part, edifying one another. So we can't overstate the need for being part of community. Now, we have our local churches, if, if you're a pastor in this group, but now we have us as peer relationships. We call this a co-collegiality when we have these tables um, that also enables us to walk in a standard of, of uh, Christ formation that we probably couldn't get from elders or others in our church at, at this level. Um, and so if we have an individualistic mindset of seeking God. It's definitely going to limit our ability to grow. Uh, Jesus said, he who has, a, he has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So our tables every week enable us to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, uh, which is a way we can also discern God's will for our own church and for ourselves. Uh, and so without a strong practical ecclesiology, we're not serious about pursuing God or spiritual formation. We have to be interdependent, not independent. We have to understand that we don't have all the gifts, even if we're standing in an apostolic function. 
that we need the whole fivefold ministry and we need the body to be part of that edification process, becoming a mature, full man and the fullness of the stature of Christ. So, Greg, anything on this? Yeah, uh, just a, a simple statement that uh, th that I always try to remember again, back from coaching days is we used to tell our team and I tell my staff this, don't get beat on alignment. Don't get beat on alignment. In, in football, if you're out of position before the snap of the ball, you've already lost, you've already lost and you're gonna give up a big play. And, and it's the same way with relationships in the kingdom. Don't get beat on alignment. You know, King David, um, um, the, the Bible says, and, and we all know this, that it was the time when the kings would go off to war, but David remained at home. And that's when the sin happened with Bathsheba. And so two questions I think that are so important that we always ask ourselves is, am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And I, I've tried to even just raise in our, our three daughters, my wife and I always ask yourself that question. Am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I rightly aligned with the local church? There's one body, uh, you, you know, who's to my right, who's to my left, who, who has God placed into my life that can speak into my life at a personal level that knows me well enough that can see hey, what's going on with Greg. He's really uptight. Uh, you know, what did you mean by this statement, man? What's, what's happening there? Uh, you know, where do we fit into the body? Uh, the alignment of the, the body of Christ. So uh, I, I think that's really, really key. Don't get beat on alignment. Are you where you're supposed to be? Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? And maybe I'd add to that a third question with who God's given you to do it with. Uh, so, so the interconnected interdependence as uh, Bishop Joe, you were talking about is absolutely critical uh, for us to, can I put it this way, execute the game plan that God's given to us. Uh, don't get beat up alignment yes um one of the things dr paul tripp brought out in perhaps the best book i ever read i read it twice it's called dangerous calling and if you haven't read that book i would urge you to get it dangerous calling which depicts the unhealthy culture we have in our churches and one of his main points is what the pastor preaches, he never practices. He tries to get everybody accountable, yet he's unaccountable. He says everyone should be in a small group, yet he's never in a small group. He tells everyone they need to read the Bible to grow in God, and they only read the Bible for messages to preach. Um, this book is amazing. It's from an insider who understands the you know, and it helps answer the question, why are so many pastors falling? There has to be, it can't just be, oh, it's the devil. Um, there has to be something wrong in our culture. And he uh, really expertly detects the unhealthy culture of the typical church, the wineskin that we have in the body of Christ. And I would say it's global it's not just in america the things that are in this he's writing more to reformed and non-charismatic so you you'll be able to figure that out but most of the principles all fit uh last but not least do we major on love or the truth now it's interesting in john 14 6 jesus said i am the way then he said the truth and the life in my opinion the way has to frame the truth and the life. What charismatics have done is they bypass the way and they just preach doctrine. It's all about who's right and who's wrong. That's why we're divided uh, across the lines of ideology, politics, black, white, um, you know, and then the life, you know, you could argue, well, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the abundant life. That's the fruits of the spirit, but you could also argue that's the gifts of the spirit, speaking in tongues and all of that. So if we don't start off with the way of Christ, we are going to never understand how to apply the truth. And so unfortunately, the, this past political season has revealed vitriol in the church, 
a sick underbelly where people are fighting, unfriending each other over politics. Um, and uh, we find that it's spiritually immature people, in my opinion, are more focused on being right and winning arguments than they are in loving people. When Jesus met people, for example, his way his way was initially one of empathy that humanized people, which enabled him to present his truth to them. You just look at the woman at the well, for example. He didn't immediately lambast her for having more than one husband and living in sin. So his way was one of entering into the world of people, humanizing them, and you find that in the beginning part of the Sermon on the Mount, Mount in uh, Matthew chapter five, he talks about being poor in spirit, showing mercy and mourning with others, which is empathy. So when Jesus met people, his initial uh, way of connecting was one of empathy and then the truth came out. And so when we understand this, we realize that when we are dealing with other people, it can't be that it's just about right and wrong. We can't just, you know, we just can't have as a goal to win an argument. That shows spiritual immaturity. You have people uh, even supposedly theologians that are bad-mouthing each other um, and uh, disfellowshipping and going crazy over things that I wouldn't even consider cardinal doctrines of the church. So this shows that we can be developed, overdeveloped in the mind and underdeveloped in the soul, in the emotions. Uh, Greg, anything on that? Yeah, just real quick, it, it reminds me, I uh, I heard, I think it was Andy Stanley one time said, uh, you know, do you want to make a point or make a difference? And and uh, and I think we all want to make a difference for the kingdom of God, obviously. And uh, so so that's really big about speaking the truth in love. And, and Bishop, actually, I'm about to, after we're done this morning, record a sermon for this week about Jesus' statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I really appreciate appreciate you your statement and now i'm going to scrap all my notes and we'll start from scratch this afternoon before we record that that was great uh but but i, I think that's the key you know we want to make a difference for jesus's sake and and so it's not about making a point there's we do speak the truth but it's it's in the way that we do it it's in the the motivation and the love and the compassion that we show as we're doing it and we all know we can feel the difference uh, how someone speaks to us uh, when, when it, there's really love and compassion and tenderness. Uh, you know, that's a word that just keeps hitting me, tenderness, uh, when I think about how Jesus spoke with tenderness. He was direct. Uh, he was clear, but there was a tenderness. And uh, that, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of leader, that's the kind of person I want to be. And and I want those around me to say uh, about me. That's what I ascribe to and hope. Yeah. Okay. Well, any questions or comments about this? This is an important discussion. And Victor, please connect with Vince about some of the needs we have because you're the host now because of my instability with the internet. So any questions, comments about these seven points? And of course, when I'm talking about uh, uh, the way of Christ, when I'm minimizing the truth, of course, the truth is always gonna be the truth, whether we agree or not. It's, a, it's about getting people to meet the truth to be able to connect to the truth. And the way to do that is through the way of Christ. So that's the point. We're not compromising the truth. Any comments? Yes, sir. Bishop? Yes. 
just adjusting my camera here. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, go ahead. Excellent. Um, well, I've, I've definitely enjoyed this morning's table. I want to ask if you have any uh, tips on leveraging tension, especially amongst the, the uh, fellow laborers, uh, maybe uh, assistant pastors, associate pastors, um, those who labor with you, serve alongside you in ministry. Uh, what are some things that you can just kind of speak into regarding dealing with tension among uh, those who are serving in the local assembly? Greg, you want to answer that? Uh, sure, I'll take a, a stab at it. Um, you know, I, I think that in terms of the family is the building block of society. And so I look at my staff, we have 15 people, employees of the church that, uh, you know, we're a family. And, and so just like in a family, when there's tension, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> you know, we don't like to uh, keep elephants in the room or, or anything like that. And sometimes it's going to be some tough conversations to have, but we're going to be open and honest. Uh, and because we love each other, and we trust each other. Hopefully we built that over time that we can have some honest conversations about whatever that tension might be. Uh, that's one of the number I feel like uh, as the, the lead pastor, that's my responsibility is to be aware of what those tensions are and then to, okay, let's talk about this. Uh, let's have a conversation uh, about this and let's come to a place of understanding and agreement. Uh, the environment of the of the team of the culture is is one of the most important things, really. Um, otherwise, we're we're just uh, spinning our wheels and we're not going to make a difference uh, if it's not right amongst the team there. So uh, we again regularly have times weekly. I have several meetings. It's just about evaluating what we're doing and what the culture, what the climate is on our staff, on our team, and how can we can how can we improve those things. Uh, I think it's a lot more important than probably, uh, Kyle, that a lot of us actually give, uh, give priority to what, what you're asking there. Um, so that's just a couple practical ways how we try to manage those tensions or resolve those conflicts. Mm -hmm. How linear are you usually with uh, the scriptures? For instance, Matthew 18, you know, it talks about when there's a fault or uh, there's an ought against your brother. It talks about you know settling it in in, in a specific um, in a specific order biblically. Um, do you follow that biblical model? Of course, all of us we want to do our best to be as linear and as parallel to the scriptures. But uh, do you ever find yourself in a place where you know John three? It talks about how the Spirit it blows on us, and uh, we'll need to always be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit, especially as senior leaders. Uh, are you more uh, uh, applying scripture line by line, or are you more saying, Holy Spirit, this is more case by case? Um, can you share about that? Uh, over the years, obviously, I've had uh, times where I had to like step through Matthew 18 step by step like that uh, with, with leaders in the church and, and uh, members of the church. Uh, more recently, it, it seems like it's more of the Holy Spirit's direction. Just even this week, I had to contact a, a, a real influential leader in the church because of uh, some of these tensions and said, hey, listen, we need to sit down. We need to talk. Uh, it was through a text message that I sent it. I have a real great relationship with him. And I said, I love you. I'm concerned about this blank situation and uh, I want you to pray about it and then let's get together and let's talk about it and so that would be a, a first step in in really managing one of those tensions one of those conflicts and it's about expectations and and uh, and again this is a real high level uh, non-staff person but a, a real real high level leader in our church um, and and uh, you know it, it's the it's the little thing boxes that that uh, you know ruin the vineyard there. So I, I think it's real important um, that that we're kind of aware of this at, at all times. But most of the time, in answer to your question, Kyle, it's not been a real linear through the scripture. There have been those times. I'd say probably five six times in the last thirty years that I can think of where I've had to just methodically walk through that process. Uh, mm -hmm. But a lot of times, it's it's the Holy Spirit's direction and following that. Thank you. 
Yeah, when you look at Matthew 18, it's just giving you principles, but the application of it has to be intuitive based on, so you might be at the first part of Matthew 18 for a year. If your brother sins against you, go to him and him alone. And the only time you stop that process is when there's an impasse and there isn't an openness to talk. Um, then you have to bring in two or three other mature people and begin another level of dialogue. But if there is an openness, but there's a lot of unresolved issues that take a lot of conversation, you may be at the first part of Matthew 18 for a long time. So it's never just cut and dry legalistic. So I don't know if that helps. Very helpful. Thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, okay, so anybody else? Hey, Dr. Joe, number four, um, how, how we respond to our stimuli, the, that's what I wrote in the notes. Uh, I never quite heard anything uh, put that way with that particular language. Uh, can you unpack that just a little bit more? Is that just talking about how we respond to crisis or negative things that happen? Or is it actually talking about something else using the word stimuli? Yeah, no, it's about the outside challenges, the environment, the things other people do to us, COVID, unrest politically. You know, it's just dealing with the outside challenges. And so how we internally respond to that will determine if we are um, growing. So we could either get bitter or better. So if we blame ourselves, I'm sorry, if we blame others instead of taking responsibility when things go wrong, we won't grow. We'll actually um, either decrease in our abilities to, to become more like Christ or we will uh, be more like Christ. I mean, it's, it's a day-to-day -day thing. And the other thing I want to say about Kyle's point is that unity is very fragile. Do, do never take for granted the unity you have with your staff. You have to develop a culture of unity, a culture of openness. There has to be regular um, dialogue, uh, transparency, and intuitiveness between the staff in order to continue to have a healthy staff. If you go a long period of time without communication or if that is a regular uh, rhythm in, in the staff where there's hardly any real communication, you're just gonna have religious robots. You're not gonna know who's thinking what, how they're processing changes, how they're processing the crises going on and any transition that you guys are going through. And transition in the church will ultimately reveal who's really tracking with you. You may be shocked as to the people who are not tracking with you, including your top elders, if you don't have regular meetings. So every, all unity, including with your marriage, your children, all unity between humans is fragile. Don't ever take for granted any relationships you have, because the moment you do, it will start deteriorating. It will start having, uh, you know, the law of attrition will start uh, popping up. Uh, okay, so Vince, if I'm the host, how do I, uh, you want me to hit custom live, right? Correct. Live on custom live streaming service. I'm hitting that now. Tell me if it went through. It went through, you are the man. Okay, well, knock me off the, I can't see anything now. <laughs> oh, man. Um, and we have to start the next table in a minute. So it's saying broadcast meeting, Zoom. Oh, you're fine. You're good to go. That's just a, a extra splash screen, but everything is um, up and running. Okay. Oh, no. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, um, I just took myself off. Okay, here we go. This is scary. Is it still? Okay, it looks like it's still live streaming. Okay, great. Yeah. We see Dr. Chand on. It's good to see you, Sam. 
Praise God. Um, now, Vince, I, can you be the host again in case I get knocked off the... I, I can. Internet? Yep. I've already been given the um, uh, permissions, so we're good. All right. So are you the host now or I'm, not? I'm a co-host. So if you wanted to switch that, you could before we get going on the 11 o'clock meeting. Okay. Making you the host. All right. Great. So in case I get knocked off, you will carry the interview with Dr. Chen. And, um, and then at 11.35, I think it is, Matt Staver is coming on. Okay. All righty. So let's, it's 10.58, let's close in prayer. Uh, okay, Victor, can you close in prayer? Father, we thank you for this wonderful and robust conversation um, regard, regarding our lives, regarding how we need to walk circumspectly in every area of our lives. Thank you, uh, Father, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Lord, I thank you for the counsel among the elders. We praise you for this, Lord God, for this ongoing um, opportunity and privilege to be able to hear <clears throat> from each other's hearts. So Lord, I pray that you would um, bless mightily this next hour as we hear uh, wisdom, the wisdom from on high. Uh, I pray, Lord God, that you minister to all of our needs so that we in turn would be able uh, to receive this wisdom and share it with our teams and with our church families, uh, Lord, and with our families, Lord God. Uh, thank you, my God, for ministering to us through your word and through the body, Lord God, and to our peers. We're so grateful to you, Lord God, for friendships and partnerships uh, that allow us to continue to grow uh, together, uh, Lord God, uh, in this time, especially in this very confusing time where many people don't have clarity. So, Father, we thank you for clarity. Thank you for the wisdom of God. Thank you for the peace of God. Thank you for the joy of the Lord. Thank you, Father, for restoring our passion in ministry, Lord God, our passion for your presence, Lord God, to always put you first, Lord God, and uh, to also, uh, also you remind us, Lord God, to take care of our families, uh, my God, to minister to our wives and to understand the importance of our uh, marriage, our relationships, my God, our relationship to our children. Uh, Father, we bless you for it. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay. Well, we're grateful to God that we're together again. Um, it's been quite an uneven and tension-filled mm -hmm. 12 months. It's hard to believe that we've only been locked down as a nation for 12 months, starting in uh, March. And with that, there have been enormous tensions that have flourished, not only in our local churches and in our particular families, but also in the nation. And even if everything in our family is okay, the tension in the nation spills over into the culture of our house, if we're not careful, into the atmosphere of our um, church, and uh, as strong as I thought our local church was, and as unified as I thought I was with our core leaders, um, it was tough navigating through this season because things were excavated related to political beliefs, um, sensitivity regarding our background, our ethnicity, our psychological makeup, the way we were raised, everything that could be tested would come out. Personality, uh, personality quirks, any kind of uh, emotional immaturity was all brought to the surface during the past 12 months. If it wasn't the civil unrest uh, because of, of the death of George Floyd, it was the political turmoil because of the presidential election uh, if it wasn't that, it was COVID. 
And uh, I'm trying to be very practical during this season of Lent regarding Christian and spiritual formation. So I've asked my dear friend, Dr. Sam Chan to join us today. Sam, how are you doing? I'm doing amazingly well. I'm honored to be on this call. Thank you for the invitation. Well, Sam, you are such a dear friend and he's been one of my mentors for many years and I have big conversations with him. I don't bother him with little strategic questions. And uh, he has been a leadership consultant, a global leader for over three decades. And um, I can't say which of his books is the best. He just has so many incredible books um, that have helped me out when it comes to understanding the culture of your church. He has a the most extraordinary book ever written on culture. Um, I forgot the name of it, but he could tell us the name. Uh, he came out with a book a, a few years ago called Leadership Pain, where he talked about how the threshold of our leadership will be determined by our, I'm sorry, the ceiling of our leadership will be, term, be, be determined primarily not by our anointing or gifts, but by our threshold for pain, profound thesis unpacked in that book and most recently he's written a book on stress and so Sam uh, with all of your travels and contact with numerous pastors and and marketplace leaders uh, how has the level of stress or tension affected the church the past year is it worse than you've ever seen or is it normal I mean what is your opinion on what's been going on the last 12 months. Well, thank you, uh, Apostle Joseph Matera for this invitation. Before I answer that question, which I will, uh, I'm recalling and I'm looking at you, we were both much younger when we met for the first time. I clearly remember the first time you and I met. It was 1998. Uh, I was doing a conference, a citywide conference that uh, our mutual friend who's with the Lord now, Bob Johansson, Pastor Bob Johansson, had uh, convened on Long Island and uh, in the new facility he had just built. And I was doing this conference, so I forget what I was teaching on, that's irrelevant, but I was doing this conference. And during the middle of the conference, I gave a break to the people. There were hundreds of people in the room. And you walked up to me and you brought a word of correction to me. And you said to me, uh, I know you said this, but I think it really needs to be said this way. And and I remember that tension point because, uh, you know, I'm the platform speaker. I don't know Joe Matera from anywhere. And uh, he brings correction to my life. But in that moment, I realized you were right and I was wrong. And I I clearly remember uh, walking back onto the platform once the uh, intermission was over and I called you by name. Isn't it crazy how we remember those little things there? I called you by name and I told the audience that what I had said before the break uh, needed correction. And I uh, gave them the correction that you gave me. And that is how our relationship began in 1998 in Long Island, New York. And here we are, uh, fewer hair, was not turning gray, it's turning loose. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're spending more of our life together. So first of all, I want to say something to everyone on this call. God will bring people into your life in the most uh, unpredictable ways. Like he did uh, Apostle Matera into my life. And when he brought him into my life in a very unusual way, here we are still doing life together. And I just wanted to just put that out there that in the midst of tension, I'm getting to the question now, in the midst of tension, I think we have to be aware that we need tension relievers. Now, many people medicate their pain, their tensions in different ways. Uh, They medicate it by getting angry. They medicate it by uh, hiding under a couch. They medicate it through alcohol, drugs. 
they uh, medicated through illicit uh, relationships. Uh, they're medicated by uh, doing so many different things. But the best medication I have found for tension are relationships. Relationships. In my book, uh, Leadership uh, Pain, I talk about how all of us need pain partners. All of us need pain partners. In my life, in my life, I have five pain partners. I have five pain partners. These, I can call them my best friends. I can call them my homies. <laughs> I call them, I, these are people I hang out with, but I have five pain partners who help me release my tension. Now, you need to know something about these, these uh, five tension relievers in my life. They are all believers. They are all Christian leaders, but none of them try to give me a placebo. None of them try to take the pain away. None of them are trying to bring solutions. None of them are trying to be judgmental. None of them are trying to bring me easy answers or easy believism. Uh, but they are people that I can relieve tension with because now for the question, am I seeing more of tension in our world? I would say we are seeing more of it because there are more uh, things pushing the tension out. For example, if I was to if I was to look at uh, our ecosystem that creates these tension points, I can think of four things that are creating this environmental ecosystem that bring tension to the rise. Number one is uh, what you mentioned already, Joe. That is about the greatest physical pandemic we have seen since 1918, since the Spanish flu. So it's, uh, it is the talk of everything that goes around us. The second thing is that we have seen the greatest financial setback since the Great Depression of 1929. The third thing that you talk quite a bit about in this introduction is the greatest social upheaval since uh, the 1960s. And please know this, while we are experiencing social upheaval in the United States of America, uh, if you're keeping your eyes open, they are everywhere, they are everywhere. Australia had uh, uh, marches in dozens of countries the day before yesterday. Uh, that spilled over from UK where a, a lady was uh, uh, raped and murdered. Uh, and there, there are upheavals in my country of uh, motherland of India, uh, where the farmers uh, have had the longest ever blockade of a capital city going on right now. Uh, so there's social upheavals everywhere. Uh, and the last thing that I want to talk about that creates our ecosystem is uh, every leader I'm talking to is tired. Maybe we can talk about why that is, but every leader is tired, fatigued, frazzled, fried. Uh, and I think the tension point comes in when uh, we try to put on a persona to the people we are leading that we've got it all together. When we're on the inside, we are falling apart. So uh, there's incongruence, there's dissonance going on in our lives as to what we are actually experiencing experiencing and what we are projecting our experience to be. So while we are trying to keep everyone propped up, keep everyone lifted up, keep everyone encouraged, uh, speak into everyone's life, very few of us have really the kind of friends we need, the pain partners we need, the tension relievers we need with whom we can be totally vulnerable. And so yes, there's more tension. Yes, there's reason for more tension. And I think uh, leaders are more tense today because they, we are realizing that the props that we had, church attendance, uh, our budgets, our staff, our multi-site, our conferences, the props that we had that made give us a high on a regular basis are all taken away from us. And so, yes, there's more tension. And yes, there's an opportunity for us to be tension relievers for somebody else and invite people into our lives. Wow. Well, um, in terms of how we should deal with this ongoing stress, it doesn't seem like 
the pandemic is going away anytime soon, even with the vaccinations, it still might be around. Uh, if there's a variant, it could be around for longer than you know, three to six months. Um, so to deal with this ongoing pandemic and continual uh, divide in our country, culturally, politically, ethnically, um, how do we protect ourselves? Uh, what habit patterns uh, and and what can we do to, to continue in the journey without giving up? And I guess the second question is, are there any good things that could come out of tension and stress? How does God redeem it? Does God have a plan for it? Or is it all a waste of time? Is it something we should pray away? So those are two questions I have. Well, thank you very much. Those are profound questions. So I want to begin by saying that resolving tension creates tension. Uh, you go into a meeting, there are two people who are disagreeing and you're the mediator, resolving tension creates tension. So you never get rid of tension. You, you can either uh, replace tension, you can move tension, you can create more tension. Uh, so, so those are kind of things that I think we have to, uh, uh, to uh, remind ourselves. Uh, going into a room and fighting against mediocrity, for example, creates tension. A church service, if you think about it, is full of tension. Uh, I, I, you know, the days that I used to travel, thank God that I'm not traveling anymore, but uh, the days that I did travel, you could, you could sense the tension in a service. Now, this, not all tension is bad. Uh, you know, tension can be really, really good as well uh, because there are predictable times of tension in an organization. You know, when God is working on my life, uh, creating more maturity, there's tension. Uh, so let me talk about that. In, in, uh, in the Bible, in the Bible, God has taken everybody through four sequences, four sequences. Uh, those four steps in come in that, in that order. Let me give those four to you. And if you're writing these down, they all start with the letter D, D as in David. Uh, so they all start with the letter D. So let me give those uh, four to you. And then uh, I also want to answer the second question uh, about the benefits of tension. So why is tension? Is it a waste of time? Should we give up? When should we give up? If we should give up, not give up. Uh, so let me give you those four and then let's talk about those. The first one is declaration, declaration, declaration. Number two is distress, distress. Number three is development. And number four is demonstration. Number four is demonstration. Let me give those four to you again. Number one is declaration. Number two is distress. Number three is development. And number four is demonstration. Number one is declaration. So when God declares something of your life. Could be prophetically through open awareness, could be open doors, could be a booming voice from heaven, could be a, a thing that you feel in your spirit, in your soul. However it is, you feel that declaration on your life. Now, my background is I was born and raised in a Pentecostal pastor's home, a spirit-filled Pentecostal pastor's home in India. So my journey and my tribe is spirit-filled, Pentecostal. That, that's my tribe, okay? So I need to tell you where I'm at because I'm where I'm going with this. So the way I was raised and our theology was that if number one happens, God declares in your life, you immediately start looking for number four, which is demonstration. God said it, and so it is. Well, Nobody told me, at least in my tribe, <laughs> in which uh, everything got prayed away, in, in my tribe and prophesied away, you know, in, in my tribe, they forgot to tell me the two steps that come between declaration and demonstration. Because the very next step is distress. So I want to give you something interesting to do. Take any Bible character in the 66 books. Take any Bible character, any Bible character, 
that God declares something on their life. And then you will see those four steps, bam, 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 played out in their life. Daniel, David, Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, Abraham, Gideon, Samson. I mean, whoever comes to your mind. I want to I give you the example that blows my mind, that blows my mind. So there is Jesus waist deep in the water in the River Jordan. Uh, getting ready to be baptized by his cousin, uh, John the Baptist, who's six months older than him. They probably grew up together and all that, you know, all their adolescence was together. Uh, John the Baptist was always a little weird and so was Jesus, you know. Uh, so they, they all had their own uh, kind of uh, uh, drummers, so to speak. And now they are both standing in the water. Jesus, God, the son is standing in the water. And according to the testimony of Jesus, his cousin, John the Baptist, is the greatest man ever to live. I mean, that's pretty big stuff. The greatest man ever to live. So in the water are two personalities. The greatest man ever to live on the human side of things. On the divine side of things, God, the son is standing there. Well, Jesus is dunk. He comes up soaking wet. Uh, and as soon as he comes up, there's this dove that buzzes them in the form of the Holy Spirit. And then there's a booming voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. So freeze that moment. Freeze that moment. The greatest man ever to live is there. The Holy Trinity is there. God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit is there. So you get that picture? I mean, if there was a selfie moment, that is a selfie moment. But immediately after the baptism of Jesus, after the great declaration on his life, after the great things that have been said about him, immediately after that, guess where we see him? In the wilderness. Distress. And then we see development taking place in his life before the demonstration starts happening. Uh, one more example. Uh, Apostle Paul, well, so Rabbi Saul, who gets a declaration in his life on the way to Damascus in what is that, Acts chapter 9. And, and, and there he is. And then he goes to uh, the, the house. Uh, and, and there's a, declara- a, a prophet comes and declares over his life. Just a few verses later, we find him preaching. And a few verses after that, guess what he is doing for his life? He's being lowered in a basket on the side of the wall. So there's declaration immediately after that distress. And the purpose of distress to your question is development. And then we see the demonstration. But this is what I found. I'll be 69 this year. And I can tell you this is what I found in my life. Nobody lives in demonstration. We get to visit demonstration from time to time. We get to have glimpses of demonstration, but nobody lives in demonstration. I can tell you where I live. I live between distress and development. And what (laughs) I have found in my life is, and other people's lives working with leaders is, that enduring development time, which I call the most painful time in I call it the in the meantime, while we are waiting on God and things are not working out for us, we are trying everything, but nothing's working out for us. It is in that meantime, in the development moment of our life that we go AWOL. We come up missing in action. We start doing stupid things. We start taking things into our own hands. And that is where the Galatian heresy comes in. When Paul says to the Galatian church, he says, who has bewitched you? That's a strong word, right? Who has bewitched you that you started in the spirit and now you're going to say, okay, I don't need it. I got this. I can handle this. You're going to end up in the flesh. So those are the four steps. And it is that it's in the development and distress moment, uh, Apostle Matera, that we try to take it in our own strength and tension points come in. So let me uh, say a little bit about... uh, the benefits of tension. And I, I'm keeping my eye on the clock here too, because I know you, you've got things happening after this as well. Uh, benefits of tension, because you realize that tension is part of life and it's not always negative. It's not always negative. But this is what I've also found. Relationships grow and mature in tension. 
the best relationships you have on the planet right now are relationships with whom you've had much tension. And your relationships have grown in that tension. It could be relational tension. It could be financial tension. It could be partnership tension. It could be theological tension. It could be uh, what uh, Apostle Matera was talking about earlier uh, when he goes into this meeting and he thought everybody was together on the same page and start dis discovering that, no, that's not their best assumption. We all are not even on different pages. We're in different books. We, we, we are translating life totally, totally differently. But the benefit of tension is if you allow the tension to percolate, your best and strongest, best and strongest relationships are going to come out of that tension. I also know that better decisions are made and greater clarity comes in moments of tension. When there's tension in the room, it's not like you walk in, say your thing, everybody agrees with you, you walk out. That, that is not really a productive time. You, you, you see that, did you, have you ever read the life of Jesus and his tension filled times with his own disciples? Remember the time he got so ticked off at them and says to them, when will you get it? When will you understand? I've been with you all this long. You just don't get it. Tension point. Tension point when uh, mothers were bringing the children for Jesus to uh, uh, to bless them, and his disciples were on another page. Their priorities were different. Tension points in the upper room. Uh, who's the greatest among us? Was the question disciples were asking, and Jesus is saying, "Are you all tone deaf? Do you not realize?" was coming, the tension between Jesus knowing what Judas is going to do and allowing him to carry the bag. Tension point between Jesus uh, when Mary puts the ointment on his, on his uh, feet and people are saying, well, shouldn't he have taken that and sold it? Tension point of inviting Zacchaeus down and going to his house. You read the gospels from that tension point, you will see that Jesus leverages every tension point. He never runs from tension. In fact, he creates tension. Remember one time uh, Jesus is in, the, is in the house and his disciples come to him and say to him, hey, your family is here. They want to see you. And he says, who is my family? <laughs> yeah, try that today. Uh, it, it just, life is just... So Jesus, what he did was he did not manage tension. He leveraged tension. My latest book, uh, the title of the book is Harnessing the Power of Tension. Harnessing the Power. So tension is not something that you run from. Tension is not something you manage. Tension is not something you explain. Because you have tension, please know this. It's a healthy thing. It's a healthy thing. Uh, and, and so how are you leveraging that tension? And how are you making decisions in the mid of that, of that tension? Uh, and let me say one last thing and I'll move on. I can say so much more about this. The last thing I want to say about this is no tension, no growth. No tension, no growth. Because leaders who avoid tension create more tension on their teams. Because please know this. The team knows there's tension. And when the leader acts as if there is no tension or tension is ungodly or tension is wrong or tension is unrighteous, they create more tension. So I could go on and on, but I think I need to put a pin there and uh, throw the ball back yeah. at you. Well, my, my last question to you is, and then we're going to have Matt Stavis share with us. Um, my last question to you is, okay, we know that tension is normal. We know that everybody in leadership should have some kind of level of tension based on their responsibilities and their influence. How do we know when there are danger signs that we need to get help when we are not responding well to tension. You've worked with so many leaders. You've seen, unfortunately, many leaders, even your friends, fall or quit the ministry or have nervous breakdowns. Not most of your friends, but many uh, that you've seen. So what are some of the danger signs for those of us? Uh, we got about 54, 55 leaders of movements on now. What are some of the danger signs for us to know that there's something wrong? That's a great question. So my, my paradigm, my hypothesis is that nothing happens overnight. 
my hypothesis is that's a slippery slope. And I find biblical basis for that in Psalm 1 1. He says, Blessed are the man who, you have the three steps, who walketh not, standeth not, sitteth not. The three steps walk, stand, sit. So if I see uh, a temptation and I keep walking past it, I'm cool. I stand over there to admire it, consider it, think about it. I'm inching towards the cliff. I sit down, I'm over it. So first of all, your question is uh, so good because we've got to be so sensitive at the early onset of it. So I'm going to give you a few of those. One is you start getting annoyed over small stuff. Number two is you not only get annoyed, but then you take it out on others. Number three is you have fantasies in your mind that are not godly. You find yourself sitting by yourself going on your phone and stopping a little too long at that one picture or whatever you are scrolling through. You find yourself lingering a little longer with that remote control. Now, none of them in themselves are bad because they are, that's what I consider walking because that's part of life. You cannot outgrow that. You're walking. But if you find yourself standing, that's the time for you to reach out to your pain partners. Another thing that uh, we can talk about another time is when your maturity is not as gr great as your success. Because if your success is greater than maturity, it's going to be a downfall. So before I go away, can I give your audience a gift, Bishop? Yeah, no. Uh, please uh, tell us about your latest book. And uh, Sam's books are amazing. Uh, also remind us, what is the name of your, your book on culture and your, your book, Leadership Pain? Those three books, if you can. Okay, I can do that right now. I happen to have them next to me. <laughs> yeah, this You're is a book on culture oh, called Culture Catalyst. Culture, this used to be called Cracking Your Church's Culture Code. And then it got sold from my original publishers to my next publisher. They bought it. And so the only difference is the cover is different and the title is different. Everything else is the same. So this is Culture Catalyst. The second book that you want me to hold up is... Uh, Leadership Pain, this has become a bestseller and a lifesaver. Did not think it's going to do all that, but it is doing all that. Leadership Pain. The third book that I have briefly touched on in this uh, call is Harnessing the Power of Tension. Harnessing the Power of Tension. And this is available in English uh, as well as in Spanish. So English and Spanish. So some of you who are movement leaders and have Spanish uh, speaking leaders. So harnessing the power of tension in English and in Spanish. All my books are in, in both languages, by the way, that I just held up. What I want to give everybody is a free subscription to my journal called Avail. Avail is 132 pages long. I'm going to give you a website in just a moment to go to that you can uh, access this. Uh, it's 132 pages long, glossy, full color, Christian leadership, very eclectic. And you can get this in your mailbox. I mean, a hard copy in your mailbox, free of charge, every quarter, simply by going to avail, availjournal.com, availjournal.com, avail, A-B-A-I-L, journal.com. When you go there, it's just going to ask you for your information and you're going to get that. If you are watching me from overseas, you're not in the United States of America. The same thing is available to you free again every quarter for on your digital platform. So you'll get it in email. You will get it via email and you can just read the entire magazine 
uh, on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer. So it uh, mailing stuff ac across the pond <laughs> becomes a little cost prohibitive, but we still want you to get it so you can get it free of charge. Availjournal.com. Uh, about 120,000 Christian leaders are getting this right now. And we want you and your entire network. So this is not just for you. You can just send that, uh, that website, availjournal.com, to your entire network, and they'll all get it. I am so honored for this opportunity to serve you. Well, Sam, this is profound. It's always amazing talking to you, and uh, we definitely want to hear from you again soon. So please stay in touch. You're welcome to stay on the call, but uh, bless you for all the help you're giving to so many of us leaders, including me many times having those deep conversations. Uh, so I really appreciate it. At this time, we also have Matt Staver um, on the line. And uh, Matt, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good to be with you. Okay, uh, let's make sure. Oh, we see him there. Matt, thank you. Where are, where are you now? Where are you from? I'm in, my, uh, I'm in Orlando in our Florida office. Oh, okay, great, great. Well, Matt, uh, he's just, Done, done such an incredible work. For those of you who know who Matt is, um, he's a leader of the Liberty Council and they have done an outstanding job in protecting religious liberty and fighting for Christian values uh, across the nation. And I've asked Matt if he could weigh in on the looming possibility of what many are calling the Equality Act. Uh, now, as Christians, we don't want any community, whether it's LGBT community or anybody, to be uh, discriminated against. Of course, they should be able to live where they want to live, work or whatever. But what we're talking about with the Equality Act is that uh, there is a law coming up having to do with, uh, no, with no protections or guardrails for Christian entities, including churches, nonprofits, etc. So. Matt, you're an expert on this. Should we be concerned about the Equality Act? Thank you, Joe. Absolutely, you should be concerned. Let me try to give you a brief overview of this. It's uh, HR 5 passed uh, in the US House. It's in the Senate, just had a Senate Judiciary hearing yesterday on this, and it could be called up at any time. Senator Chuck Schumer has invoked what's called Rule 14, meaning that he can bypass any committees and put it on the floor at any moment. We can stop this bill, we must stop this bill. I won't go into the details of how, uh, but we can stop it and we must stop it, but we have to be aware of it and we have to take action. And we have a webpage, uh, lc.org, lc.org forward slash HR5, it has a lot more information on it. But what does this bill do? First of all, it exponentially expands the federal government into every, I'm talking about every corner of our lives, and that includes churches. It has no exemption for churches or religious schools or organizations. And what does it do? It pushes a very radical LGBT and Q agenda, and I want to talk about Q in a moment, and abortion everywhere, including on churches and schools and so forth. The LGBTQ in the Senate version the Senate version of the bill, where it is now, says that the Q stands for queer. Now, that's their words, not mine. And LGBTQ Nation says that the Q, standing for queer, which also has stood for questioning, but it's specifically designated as standing for queer by the Senate bill itself. What does that include? Well, we are familiar generally with lesbian, gay, bisexual, transvestite, which is a person wanting to dress in the opposite sex, or transgender, somebody who wants to identify with the opposite sex and therefore even go to the extent of taking hormone blockers, hormone medication of the opposite sex, and even going through invasive plastic surgery, change their name and pronouns. And it's not just, for example, a man or a boy wanting to be recognized as she, it's also Z, there's a whole panoply of pronouns. And that would be not somebody who just wants to be identified as the opposite sex, but no sex or all sexes. It becomes very, very confusing and damaging. And at the end of the day, it's ultimately an attack directly on God who created us in his very image and made human sexuality a thing of beauty to unite husband and wife, 
into one, to have procreation of another human being in his image, and also the Ephesians component of it, a spiritual dimension that helps us to understand the sacrifice and the unifying, unifying of Jesus in the incarnation to his creation. So it is a very precious, very unique creation of God. And whether it's abortion or LGBTQ, it's an attack directly on that creation. So what does the Q stand for? If it doesn't, if you already have lesbian, gay, bisexual, transvestite, and transgender covered, LGBTQ nation and others say that it actually stands for the entire panoply outside of LGBTQ. What is that? That's the 500 and nearly 50 sexual paraphilias. And one of those is pedophilia. And there are organizations that are dedicated. There's a group called Before You Act. You can see what they're talking about even in the name, Before You Act. They are an academic and a counseling organization. You can't just write them off as some blogger in a basement somewhere. This is an organization that works with academics and counselors across the country. They have seminars at Johns Hopkins University and other places of reputation to push the idea that pedophilia, being attracted to minors, is just another sexual orientation and a gender identity, and it ought to be legally protected. The Q includes all of those paraphilias, one of which, of course, and I won't go into all the others, is clearly ped pedophilia. Now, so that's how broad this agenda is. It applies to your beliefs, believe it or not. We've never seen a, a law like this. It is the most dangerous law I've ever seen come out of Congress in history of America. And I don't use that to be exaggerating or you know, overemphasizing, it's true. It applies to your beliefs on this issue of LGBTQ and abortion, your perceptions on it, whether it's actual or perceived or whether or not someone says you took an action regarding them because of some relationship that they don't become, they're not LGBTQ or abortion, but it's something that they've related to in their past. Maybe they had a friend who was lesbian, gay, bisexual, transvestite, or transgender, and you didn't take any action with regards to that. Maybe you don't even know, but you take an action and you ultimately are accused of that. It applies to churches because what we see here is in 1993, Congress passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to restore the protection of free exercise of religion, which the Supreme Court damaged in 1990 with a decision by Justice Scalia. And I like Justice Scalia's opinions, but this was one of his worst. And everybody that works in religious liberty agrees across the board. It was a terrible decision. It weakened the free exercise of religion of the First Amendment. We're working to overturn that. But until that, what happened is Congress got together Democrats, Republicans, independents, people of all different spectrums, whether you're liberal or center or right, doesn't matter where you are, they got together. And they said, we need to restore the protections of the First Amendment back to where they were before 1990, this Smith decision. So in the House, they passed this bill, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in 1993, unanimously. In the Senate, it was 97 to three. One of the sponsors was the current leader of the Senate, Senator Chuck Schumer. It was signed into law by Bill Clinton. It was supported on the one hand by the American Civil Liberties Union and Americans United for Separation of Church and State, and on the other hand by groups like Christian Legal Society and Liberty Council, our organization. It was widespread support, and it's done incredible good. Let me just give you an example of what it did. During the time when the federal law, the Affordable Care Act, ultimately was forcing religious organizations to provide abortion-inducing drugs and devices, Hobby Lobby objected. So did Little Sisters of the Poor. They did not want to provide abortion-inducing drugs and devices to take the lives of unborn children because they both had Christian values of being pro-life. They ultimately litigated that. Both of them went to the US Supreme Court. They won five to four decisions on the basis of the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Now, if the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act is revoked, which is what the Equality Act does, for churches and all religious organizations and people of faith. It says you cannot use it as a claim or a defense to anything in this bill, LGBTQ and abortion. If it's revoked, Hobby Lobby would then lose. They would be required, as well as churches, by the way, to fund abortion-inducing drugs and devices and abortion, hormone-blocking medications and opposite-sex hormones and surgery to remove healthy genitalia and body parts for somebody who wants to go through that kind of surgery. 
doesn't matter what your religious belief is because this law applies across the board and there would be no protection under the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And so churches and religious schools that are non-compliant, for example, if a person comes to your church and they want to use, a man wants to use the women's restroom and you say, excuse me, men's restroom is, is here, this is women's restroom. And they say, well, I identify as a woman. If you refuse them access to that women's restroom, shower room, locker room, the sports teams, or if you take a youth group on an overnight camping trip and a boy says, I want to sleep in the same tent with the girls, or you take your youth on a, a trip and you're staying in a house or hotel and you have the boys in one section, girls in another section. And a boy says, I want to sleep in the same room. And you say, well, let's give you a room by yourself. No, that's discrimination. I want to sleep in the same room. If you as a church or a religious school say, no, that violates our religious values then you will not only face a lawsuit under this bill by the United States Department of Justice, but also by the private individual who's bringing the suit and churches, nonprofit organizations, will lose their tax exempt status, not only on the federal level, but that will also include trickling down to the state, including your property tax exemptions as well. And colleges, for example, that are obviously Christian or nonprofit religious schools, will also not only lose their tax exempt status, but their accreditation, their accreditation. Now, the impact of that will mean that students attending these schools will not be able to get student loans, nor will they have a very easy time. They have a very difficult time finishing the undergraduate and going to graduate school. A law school, for example, that loses its accreditation will ultimately be able to graduate lawyers or not lawyers, individuals with a Juris Doctorate degree, but that person cannot take a bar exam anywhere or almost no place in the country unless they graduated from an accredited law school. I can tell you that there's a lot of effort having been a dean of a law school at Liberty University School of Law and taking the school through all the levels of ABA accreditation. Well before the Equality Act, there was a big push to revoke the accreditation of law schools that had biblical policies that said sexual relations is for a man and a woman in a committed marriage relationship. And those kinds of policies would ultimately be challenged. And you would have to choose, am I gonna stick with that policy and that biblical value, or am I not? And if I don't, I lose my taxism status, I lose my accreditation. To understand the impact of this, ITT Technical Institute lost its accreditation a few years ago for financial mismanagement. As a result of that, it went bankrupt within about a month and immediately shut down all of its operations nationwide. This will kill most Christian schools. It applies to your daycare. For example, your children at church, your preschool, whatever it may be. And somebody now wants to come to your children and they are one of the LGBTQ people, including, remember, pedophilia, because that will be protected under Q. And they wanna work with your children or they work with your children and then later on they want to come in dressed as a woman if they're a man or some other thing of, of that nature and you say excuse me this is not going to be appropriate for our children if you take that action that will be discriminatory think about it this way what you cannot do legally respecting race and certainly you wouldn't want to do this biblically or morally anyway you will not be able to do legally with respect to LGBT. You can't have separate drinking water fountains. You can't have separate restrooms. You can't have separate shower rooms. You can't have separate sports teams. You can't say, we're gonna segregate the boys and the girls by different races in these tents or hotel rooms. You wouldn't wanna do that biblically, but if you did it even as a church or school legally, that is contrary to federal law. So when you elevate LGBTQ and then you include that, it includes your perceptions, your beliefs, whether actual or perceived, this is a Pandora's box that ultimately is a direct attack on churches. And the people who actually testified yesterday, one of them with the human rights campaign, the president of it, they have in their documents that what they wanna do is they wanna go after Christian schools and churches regarding tax exemption and accreditation as well. This is, a, this is an all out assault, but here's also, it not only is LGBTQ, but it, and it's also and it's in your hiring, it's in your practices, it's in having weddings in your your church, 
It's also online because it says this is not limited to a physical facility or place. So it's what you have on your website, what you have on your social media, what you have in your emails. It includes everything that's online as well. All of that will be targeted. But it also includes abortion. And it will also make abortion a federal right from conception until the child is born and takes its first breath outside of the womb. It will override every existing state law, no informed consent, no parental notification, no parental consent, no waiting periods, no ultrasound, no doctor qualifications, no clinic regulations, no restrictions on late term partial birth abortion. All of that literally be wiped off in the single stroke of a pen all through nine months. And in addition to that, it will not only require state and federal funding, but it'll also require insurance companies and self-insureds to fund abortion. And that gets us back to the Hobby Lobby Little Sisters of the Poor case. And that includes churches and religious Christian schools and organizations. It is the most radical abortion bill ever to do that, literally wiping the slate clean of all protections for women and children and parents with regards to their minors making life changing, life ending decisions regarding these precious children. So I can go on and on about this, but it is a serious threat to freedom and it's a serious threat to churches and religious schools and organizations. And ultimately at the end of the day, these two have the same thing in common. And that is an attack on the very human sexuality that God created between a man and a woman as husband and wife to ultimately bring unity to that relationship, procreation to that relationship, and ultimately teach us about Jesus' commitment and his sacrifice and his love for his church. And all of that is a direct attack on God's creation. And at the end of the day, is a direct attack on God. But it is a serious threat to our freedom, and we need to take it very seriously. Here's the situation. Right now, there are not 60 votes in the House, in the Senate, to be able to overcome a filibuster. So that's good. Uh, the Senate has a rule that says somebody can filibuster, and you need 60 votes in order to get to the bottom line. But what we do know is that Rule 14 has already been invoked by Senator Schumer, meaning it could come out at any time. And here's what will happen. And here's, here's where we're working with people on the US Senate right now. There are some bills that don't go through the filibuster. Some of those are the spending bills. They require just a majority vote. Now, there have been many attempts in the past, and some of those have been successful to attach things to spending bills that people otherwise wouldn't get through the Senate. This is one of those. And how does that happen? Well, sometimes you can attach it directly to a bill and you need just 51 votes. On the other situations, you can have your 51st vote and it could be one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, uh, and then people go home and there's a few people left on the Senate floor and those people are still there. The final gavel hasn't been sounded to end that day. So the session's still open under this majority vote rule. And somebody says, I want to move for a voice vote, the Equality Act. Seeing no objections, the handful of people say, I, and there it is, it's passed. We're working with senators right now to guard every minute of every second of every day until that final gavel happens and it has to continue until uh, the end of the 117th Congress and while this bill is still in the Senate, however long that might be, and object and force it to go through a full vote. So it is a battle. I think we can win it, but on the other hand, it's going to be in intense and we have to pray and we have to act. So we have a website lc.org, lc.org, just for Liberty Council, just two letters, lc.org forward slash HR5, forward slash HR5. And what we are doing is faxing the people in the Senate, telling them to uh, stop the Equality Act because of the LGBTQ, the abortion and the revocation of religious freedom for places of worship and religious organizations and all people of faith. And the nice thing about faxing is they can't turn off their faxes. I mean, they can ignore sometimes, you know, our pleas, but they can't turn off their faxes. We're also asking people to sign petitions. We've had thousands and thousands of them going to the various members of the Senate. And then there's a place for you to call your senators as well. And obviously pray and get this word out because this is a 
I, I'm not an alarmist, but I can tell you this is a five alarm um, fire, if you will, um, because if this passes, it will be significantly threatening and devastating to so many people. It also has provisions where it would ban counselors. Licensed and unlicensed, get this, which includes your pastors, from helping someone overcome unwanted same-sex attractions or gender confusions or unwanted same-sex behavior. You can affirm them in that direction. You can encourage them to get hormones and surgery, but you can't bring freedom to their uh, life and the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. Uh, so it's very, very damaging in so many different levels. So Joe, thank you for allowing me to share. Yeah, well, we, we have a lot of leaders of movements on now, and we would encourage you to get the Liberty Council website out to, your, to you, all your churches and networks, uh, put it on social media, do whatever you need to do. Uh, we don't have much time. Uh, when is this Congress going to expire? What date do we know? Well, this one would uh, go for another two years, um, but it's possible that the bill would be ultimately nixed and it wouldn't stay alive. Um, this is what happened uh, in 2019. This same bill came up in the House. Um, it was ultimately not uh, moving in the Senate, and so we had to stay on the alert until the end of the 116th Congress, which was January of this year. Now it's back, and some things have changed. And uh, so we have to stay on alert throughout the entire 117th Congress, unless there's some way that they just completely dispose of the bill and it's off their docket. But uh, we'll let people know, literally it could come up at any moment, three o'clock this morning or you know, any time because um, this, is, this is the process, this is the procedure where they're trying to move this forward and there's a lot of pressure from some of these very special interest organizations. What is the likelihood of it being revised significantly in order to be passed uh, by the Senate? Well, the human rights campaign uh, some years ago actually uh, endorsed a measure similar to this that never really got off the ground in the House or the Senate. Uh, and it came up all the time, and it had an exemption for religious organizations and churches. And historically, that's what's happened. And, a, and a, several years ago, maybe four and a half, five years ago, the Human Rights Campaign, which is the largest LGBTQ lobbying organization in America, headquartered in Washington, DC, they led the other organizations to say, we're no longer going to ever support such a bill like this that exempts churches and religious organizations. So that's why it doesn't exempt it. So on the on one hand, I don't think they're going to be satisfied with that, even if it's proposed. On the other hand, uh, there is uh, some other proposal that some people have been trying to push. Uh, it's not from the LGBTQ advocacy organizations, it's from some other sources called the Fairness for All Act. But it frankly is a Trojan horse. Um, because you can't, I don't think you can biblically say or any otherwise say, we're not going to be concerned about this as long as the church is okay. Because if you do that, I know what the strategy has been in some of these other places. Exempt the churches, let's get it in, and then let's go after and pull out the exemption. But look, we're talking about more than churches. We're talking about people. We're talking about individuals. We're talking about women in sports. Look, the mixed martial arts, one of the top competitors in the world, um, a woman entered a, a ring with a male who says he identifies as a female. She got hit by this uh, mixed martial arts uh, person. She said she's never been hit so hard in her life. It broke her skull and she had to have her skull stapled together with seven staples. She says she'll never get in the ring like that again. Look, there are people who may be going through different kinds of um, confusion in terms of their gender, but you cannot prohibit a man, uh, whether they are dressing or looking like a woman from entering into a restroom because it's all gonna be up there. And if they say they identify as a woman, you resist, you're going to be liable. And we have a list of a lot of instances 
of men going into women's and girls' facilities. Look, we have a situation right now we're working with at Evergreen State College out in Washington State. Uh, this um, swim team from ages, I think, six to 18 uh, were practicing and they come into the locker room and they go into the sauna and the 17 year old girl opens up the sauna door. There's a man completely naked with his legs splayed open, completely naked with his legs splayed open. And she says, you need to get out of here. And she goes, calls the school authorities and says, there's a man in our sauna room. The coach, the female coach of this uh, girls and women's uh, swim team complained to the school. And the school says he has a right to be there because he says he identifies as a woman. This is a guy completely naked. This is the guy who says he's neither male nor female. He's everything. And he's got all kinds of unbelievable things on his website. I mean, this has entered already our world. And this will make it national. And it'll bring it into the churches, into the schools, and everything else. What the great gains of women have, have made over the years will literally be canceled. One of the top competitive uh, track team um, high school girls in Connecticut lost four years in a row to a male who says now he is on the male team. Two males have won about, broken about 16 or 17 women's records in Connecticut because they've been allowed to compete on the women's team. These are high school kids that are looking for scholarships. They're looking for scouts. And when they get knocked out of first, second, third place, some of them only give scholarships to the first three finishers. This is so far reaching and broad in terms of its effect. And it's damaging to women and privacy, it's damaging to their safety. And it's damaging in so many other ways. Um, with this kind of bill, uh, it, is, it, it is something that even if you say, well, what about getting religious organizations exempted? That's not enough. We can't let the rest of the culture uh, go to hell, if you will, and be in danger while we sit in our enclaves to say, well, it's not gonna, uh, we, we can still have our tax exemption and we can still move and hire people that we want. But the rest of the world out there that we deal with every single day in our churches are having to deal with this. So there's a possibility of that. I think it's remote, but I don't think we ought to be deceived by saying exempting churches or religious organizations will be the trick. So if the worst case scenario happens and they passed it undiluted as is, and it becomes a law, is there a good chance that we could sue and it goes to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court could overturn this? You can sue, but look at it this way. If somebody says, I have a religious reason for being racist. Now, that's a, an extreme example. But somebody says, I have a religious reason for being racist even though the Bible doesn't support that. They say that, they make a claim, and they, they file against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I don't wanna hire people of color because I think my race or whatever race is superior to this race. First of all, it's obviously reprehensible and offensive, but, and it's biblically wrong, it's morally wrong. No question about that. But it's also legally wrong, and it doesn't matter whether that person really does have a belief. as disturbed as it is, because you're going to lose. You're going to lose that. And you should. Now, you put LGBTQ and abortion at that same level, and you make the same argument. I have a biblical basis, and you have a sound basis for believing marriage is the union of a man and a woman. And God made us as male and female. We ought to protect our girls and our women. Abortion is wrong. It, God created us from the womb and knit us together. Fine. That may be your belief. And that's grounded in the Bible. But with this, you lose. You just lose in the same way. And that's why they're putting this in so many different federal bills. Now, you'll also lose if, with regards to much of your hiring. You may still be able to use the First Amendment because there's an exception there for pastors and teachers 
called the ministerial exception that the Supreme Court has ultimately affirmed most recently within the last two years. That you can have your pastors and teachers be consistent with your doctrine. But it doesn't go down to every person in your in your church. We don't know how far down that goes because the Supreme Court's never given us any guidance on it. The Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act would protect you in all levels. But without it, which this particular law revokes, you're vulnerable. You're vulnerable. So the Supreme Court can't even overturn this? No. Not unless somebody comes in and challenges the hiring of a pastor or a teacher in the classroom. Wow. And if it becomes law, would that mean that, well, would that mean that it would be illegal for a pastor to preach on certain texts in the Bible? Here's the thing. Think of this in the context of, of race again. I just want to use that example. Say you started putting out on your social media and your websites and your emails really racist things. First of all, how would people perceive that? But then how would your IP provider, your social media, your email provider, how would they react to that? Now, under this particular law, you add LGBTQ at that level, which is actually not at the level, it's above the level. It's above the level because you don't have in the race context uh, the situation of your beliefs or your perceptions or associations. And, and you can understand in race, for example, pretty clear. Somebody of a certain uh, skin color was not allowed to go into a particular building. Well, you've got an identifiable person, you've got an identifiable building here. You don't have an identifiable building because it comes down to your beliefs and it's not limited to a physical facility or a place. So it definitely applies in this bill to your online. So now you post that sermon online and you put it within your doctrinal statement that you believe marriage is the union of a man and a woman. God created us as male and female and life is precious uh, from the moment of conception through all stages of life. Um, that will be considered discriminatory and violative of the so-called Equality Act. Mm -hmm. And you can be a target by the DOJ, by a private suit, and I can guarantee you, uh, you'll have censorship from the social media, the IP providers, and, and other web hosting companies as well. Why? Because they will feel the pressure from the federal law coming against them if they don't act accordingly to the Equality Act. Hmm. Okay. Is this a point in time when churches and Christian organizations should consider functioning post 501c3 status? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think you need to, I mean, obviously you have to look at all these worst case scenarios, but this is not a time to give up. This is a time to pray and it's a time to act. And, right. um, you know, I'm, I'm not making my funeral plans by any chance. God is with all, he is with all, with him, all things are possible. And we've seen against all odds, what he did to the Egyptians uh, when he said, let my people go. What he yeah. did uh, to the, the Jews in Persia through Esther and um, what he's done to Daniel in the lion's den. So look, this is not a time for retreat. It's not a time to be cowardly. It's not a time to say, we're gonna do our post-mortem plans. I don't think we'd be focusing on that at all. I think we just need to move forward with prayer and we need to act. And this is something since it does directly affect the church for someone who might say, well, can the church actually get involved in this? Yes, because their IRS and we've done a lot of these uh, educational seminars on this for pastors and churches. But when the church is directly affected by any law, property tax exemption, tax exemption, accreditation, hiring, hiring of use of facilities, et cetera, then the church has unlimited capability under the IRS rules to literally engage in uh, educational campaigns, opposition, support, whatever it is of that particular issue where the church is directly involved. And, and that's clearly an exception within the IRS rules. 
and, and this is something where the church and religious organizations are a direct target. Yeah, well, definitely not a time to give up, a time to stand for righteousness, irrespective of what, what is going on in the culture. Um, so why don't we just take a few minutes before we end? We normally end by 12, but we want to thank Matt for, for being with us. Um, we're going to probably have another discussion about this in two weeks on April 1st. But um, uh, this has been incredibly eye-opening. And uh, I think just the shock value of understanding how this will bring protection to pedophilia is also another alarming trend um, that many people, people didn't see coming. So let's, uh, let's just, can Matt, can you lead us in prayer for the nation? Yeah, yeah sure can. <clears throat> yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. And Lord, we remember in Caesarea Philippi, you walked in the middle of the epicenter of darkness and paganism where the god Pan and so many other pagans and their deities were worshipped. And you took your disciples there for an object lesson. And when Peter confessed you as the Messiah, the son of the living God, you made this statement that echoes through history and that uh, on this rock you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, Lord. And we know that for a fact and we trust it and we believe it. And we pray that you will give us encouragement, confidence, boldness, and wisdom as we move forward as um, your body, as leaders in your church, Lord, knowing that no matter what it is, in any time of history, the gates of hell are not going to prevail. We pray that you'll give us a voice. We pray that you'll give us wisdom. We pray, that, Lord, against attacks on your creation of you, uh, uh, of humans uh, as male and female in your image and uh, your blessing of human sexuality and procreation and the spiritual understanding and blessing that comes from that. And we, Lord, we pray that you will give us a renewed desire, a renewed energy to not only educate, but to defend uh, your creation and our people that you've entrusted us Lord, we also pray against um, this bill, the so-called Equality Act. We pray for senators to stand up to understand the threat and to push back and say, no, this is a line that we're just simply not going to cross. We ask that, Lord. We beg you for it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Wow, what a sobering session. Uh, Matt, let's stay in touch. This was very powerful. Uh, thank you. Well, for thank you, Joe. Thanks. God bless. I'm going to have to drop off, so I will yeah, go. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Vince Thomas, can you uh, transition us now? Absolutely. And we have had a, I mean, just an outstanding session today. And I want to let you all know right now that the replay of this particular session is right now available on the YouTube and Facebook and website of US Cal. So on YouTube, and Facebook, just search uh, U.S. Cal. Uh, you can go to the website, uscal.us. Uh, we also want to bring to your attention, if you're looking to connect and partner with uh, what U.S. Cal is doing, please uh, visit our website to find out how you can become a member today. Or if you desire to financially support um, just uh, the opportunity to be able to connect with other leaders from across the world to get pertinent information that's going to help you lead effectively, uh, consider... Uh, giving toward the vision fund uh, of U.S. Cal as well. Uh, but that's all that I have. We look forward to seeing you all on next week. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, Bishop Joe, back to you. All right. Well, love you all. Uh, sorry we went over a little bit, but uh, this we're in an amazing crisis right now, so we needed, a, we needed to extend this. Uh, let's just take a minute to say goodbye. Good to see all of you, Apostle Buddy Crumb, Reg, Barbara,